Okay. <laughs> Lois said he had a uh, surprise introduction for me. I was a little disappointed, Will, that you didn't have that memorized. <laughs> uh, every time he's ever preached at, uh, at Red River, he never has any notes. And he makes a really a strong impression on those who come to hear our young preachers. Uh, it's a privilege, uh, an honor uh, to be in your midst tonight. The Louisville Church is a special church. Uh, you know that. I, I don't have to sell you on this church. Uh, you recognize uh, uh, there are many things about it that are unique, that are very strong. Uh, and things that happen here are building up the kingdom. And that's what we try to do in northern New Mexico. Uh, there are very, very many small churches. Uh, I doubt very many of you have ever been a member of a church of five or less members. Uh, but there are a number of those in New Mexico. And so it excites me uh, that you have this interest, that you care about what's happening in New Mexico. Just real briefly, uh, this is a work of the University Church that Cheryl and I attend when we're in town. Uh, we try to be in New Mexico at least two Sundays uh, out of every month. And then I preach at a little small church outside of Amarillo one Sunday. And then one Sunday we try to be home uh, if we possibly can. Uh, but the idea of our elders in beginning this work was said to strengthen of those small churches uh, who don't have full-time preachers. None of them have full-time preachers. Uh, many of them are using DVDs uh, as their Lord's uh, lesson uh, on the first day of the week. But we've tried to go there and do what we possibly can to uh, encourage them. Probably most of you will know me more for the family encampment than for Operation Northern New Mexico. But we consider these all part of the same work. When we began the family encampment in 1987, Brother Harold Payton, who at that time was a missionary among those small churches being supported by the Skillman Avenue Church in Dallas, uh, Harold had this vision of how can we get these small churches together, uh, get them under a tent, and maybe as we preach to them, it will help unite them, strengthen them, grow them, uh, and they'll be there uh, when we're all gone. And so that's the reason why in 1987 we began to try uh, to draw people to New Mexico. And many of you have come. I look at your faces. I don't know your names always. Uh, I have to ask Cheryl every morning what her name is. So I understand how this, uh, I can't associate a name with you, but I can associate a face and recognizing that you've been to the Red River Family Encampment. If you haven't, uh, Jeff told me to make sure I said this. Come once. I promise you. If you'll just make that long. It's a long journey from Louisville, Texas to uh, Red River, New Mexico. I understand that. Uh, we suggest that you go from here to Amarillo and spend the night. And then drive from Amarillo on up to Red River. It's about five hours from Amarillo. And so you can break your day up and not kill yourself driving uh, in one day all the way to Red River, New Mexico. Uh, it's a place that gets you an opportunity to see the glories of God. Uh, it's a place where people uh, gather uh, under a big, big tent. And we're having somewhere between uh, 1,700 and 2,000 folks that gather there now uh, on that mountain. Uh, we're at uh, right at 8,700 feet uh, elevation. A little, little higher than Louisville. Not much. Just a little bit higher. And, uh, and then we're right at the base uh, of a mountain that's 10,500 feet. So you can go up on that mountain uh, and lose your breath and, uh, you know, have to go to the hospital and all those things. But uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world that God has created. So uh, the family encampment is not just about getting brothers and sisters together. It's also about gaining a greater appreciation for God's creative activity. And so that's the reason why we chose that particular part of the world. I, I know that Louisville, Texas is a beautiful, beautiful, I, I've seen your mountains, I, I've seen your lakes, you know, I've, I've seen all of the handsomeness that you have in this location, uh, but just try Red River one time. Uh, not only, of course, do we enjoy uh, having the opportunity to have folks come in from all over, literally all over the United States, 
But the singing, the singing I think is special. And then you get to hear Will Campbell. Uh, and you know, it's worth the trip to hear Will, promise you. Uh, plus the fact that we have uh, eight-year-olds that preach to us uh, on Sunday and Saturday, uh, Saturday and Sunday nights. We have the, the young men uh, begin our services with five-minute sermons. Uh, Will, I'm glad you didn't just give me five minutes. I appreciate that a whole bunch. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the churches, uh, well, for whatever reason, my screen wants to jump. Uh, these are the churches that we serve. Uh, many of them you may have driven through. I have to confess, for 25 years I had driven through these little communities on my way to the Red River Family Encampment and never stopped and worshipped with these little churches. And they'll tell you, uh, it's not what greatness you're going to bring to them. What they would like you to do is stop and sing with them because when there's only five, they know what everybody sounds like. And they kind of like to hear a new voice. Just someone, well, they like to hear somebody that can sing the tune uh, because most of them do not know the music to the words uh, that they've listened to for many, many years. And so you can be valuable to them just by coming and singing the tune uh, that is written uh, in the book. Uh, this is uh, what we're doing in New Mexico. Uh, we had a uh, addition to a building uh, that was really a blessing to them. And uh, we also host uh, the men's retreat, which we just returned from uh, last weekend. Uh, we have 20 to 25 uh, brothers from those uh, leaders among those churches uh, that will gather with us there. That's a little bit about who I am and, and what kind of work uh, we're trying to do. Did you watch the video? Did you see it live when Brant Jean hugged Amber Geiger? Did you see that? If you haven't seen it, go on the internet and find it. Because probably, I know Jeff preaches great sermons. And there are other brothers in this part of Texas that I know faithfully preach and proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But I want to tell you that what Brant did representing his family, forgiving a woman who had murdered his brother, may have been the most powerful gospel sermon preached in decades in North Texas. Because you see, what God has called us to do is to share, to extend, to give forgiveness. It came at a price. It's precious. It's valuable. And people all over this earth are desperately needing to know they can be forgiven. And here we sit. Uh, here we sit. And we know what it is to be forgiven. We know what it is to be reconciled. We, we know what it is to experience this greatest of all human experiences possible. The forgiveness of our sins, the redemption of our souls, the promise of an eternity. Turn with me to John, Gospel, John. Let's look together at the, the uh, prayer that Jesus prayed on his way to the cross. I always think that it's necessary for us from time to time to go back and look at our Lord's last thoughts. You know, when you know you're facing an ultimate destiny, you probably say things that need to be said, but you just have to find the right time to say them. Beginning in that 17th chapter, I'd, I'd like to go to verse 14 and read after there. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so the world may know, so the world may know, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus is giving these men a mission. But he wasn't just giving it to them. He was giving it to you and me. And that mission is the very same mission that he came to fulfill when he came to this earth. I have come to seek and save the lost. When we lose that vision, we, we lose that intention, we lose something of Jesus. Because that's, that's what he's about. Oh, I, I, I want to glorify Him. I want to praise Him. But I want to know He left heaven and He came to this life and He experienced every frustration you could ever imagine experiencing. He, frustra he, he experienced every disappointment that you could imagine. Your friends leaving you when you're dying. One of your friends that has been with you for almost three years selling you for 30 pieces. What, what other kind of frustration, what other kind of disappointments could he have experienced more than he experienced? And yet, and yet, in his dying on the cross, when speech is almost impossible because you cannot breathe on a cross, he yet is able to push himself up enough to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the message that he's given you and me. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. Go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians. Listen to Paul. Paul was a latecomer to the kingdom. He wasn't with the twelve. And yet he, he somehow he comprehended what God's purposes were in his son. He says in verse 11, Therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, uh, we might even say knowing the awe of the Lord. We persuade others. But what we are is known to God and I hope it's known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves it is for God if we're in our right man mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died 
for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. All this, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And listen, this is, this is where it gets to you and me. And gave us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's ours. It's ours. It's a, it's a blessing that it's ours. Let's don't ever regard it as a, a burden. Yes, it's an obligation. But no burden. It's just the fact that we have received this blessing first and we get to share it with each and every person that we come in contact with if we have a mind to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ. Now, if we don't have that mind, we're, we're not going to fulfill His mission because we have to have a mind for doing His mission. Uh, that's one of the things I like about coming to Louisville because I know this is a church that really wants to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ. Paul continues, He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's forgiveness. Not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of re re reconciliation. Therefore, therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Get your life right first. Paul is saying, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I hope we understand none of us will ever stand before God with our righteousness, but we will stand before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's worth sharing. That's worth giving to others the privilege of standing before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ the Christ. And then Paul, there's not, shouldn't be a division here, but somebody decided this was chapter 6. Working together with him. Working together, together with God. Working together with God. <laughs> Does that blow you away? That we, in, in all of our faults, in all of our weaknesses, I, you don't want to stay here long enough to hear all mine. I, pr I promise you don't. And I have to tell you, I don't want to stay here long enough to hear all yours either. But I want us to realize that we have a tremendous blessing, a, a honor to be in partnership with God. You know, if Jerry Jones, not the preacher Jerry Jones, nobody would be interested in being partners with Dr. Jerry Jones, but if, if, if the Jerry world, Jerry Jones, walked in this pulpit and said, I'm looking for some partners, would it be hard for you to accept that opportunity? Would it be hard for you to say, I'll be your partner. What is it going to take? Well, just show up. Just show up. Be my partner. Would you, would you find that a difficulty? Huh. I think many of us would. But I'm telling you, <laughs> we've got a greater partnership than Jerry Jones will ever be. We've got a partnership with the Creator God. 
we got a partnership with the one who has redeemed us and reconciled us and will resurrect us and will receive us in the last day. So Paul says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, and this is to us, behold, now is the favorable time. I think about what Brant Jean did. And I'm wondering right now how many hearts have been prepared to seek forgiveness because of Brant's actions. And I'm wondering how many of us are going to take advantage of these hearts that may now have been softened. I want to tell you, it was not easy for Brant to forgive that woman that killed his brother. Don't you treat that as though it was just a flippancy or a casualness. I promise you that Brant had been in prayer for weeks upon weeks to know how God wanted him to deal with this murderer. And he chose to forgive. And there are hearts today that I'm convinced are ready to seek forgiveness because they know now. They know now. They haven't murdered anybody. Oh, they've done some bad things, but maybe they haven't murdered anybody. But they know they need to be forgiven. And so we do what we do. We come into our assemblies. We pray for each other. We pray for the lost. We pray that we will seek and save. We pray that the kingdom will grow. We pray that lives will be changed because we're here and we're about the Father's business. It's so important for us to recognize that your mission gives your life significance. William James said, the best use of life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. We're about an eternal kingdom business. We're not about winning football games. We're doing something that is so vitally important, so necessary, so blessing. And your mission will bring glory to God. This is what Paul is saying. We now are the people of the favorable time. We now are the people of the day of salvation. Let me tell you something to take home. Three things. Your mission should provide you with a sense of obligation. We read that passage from Romans. Paul says, I'm under obligation. I owe it to God to preach the gospel. I owe it to God to share the forgiveness. I owe it to God to make it available. I owe it to God. Your mission should be accomplished with eagerness. We only have a short time on this earth. I turn 77 this next, or this month, a few days from now. My mother died at 77. I'm in excellent health. Doesn't mean I won't have a stroke tomorrow, as my mother did. She had a lot of health issues. But I'm simply saying to you, we're limited in time on this earth, and we're limited in opportunities to preach to those that are lost, and we need to be eager to get it done. We don't need to be passive. We need to be the people that are the most determined to get the world saved. We're God's people. There's nobody else on this earth given this task and blessed with this responsibility. And finally, your mission should be done unashamedly. Don't let folks, don't let anybody make you feel like you're being, quote, 
judgmental because you're telling them about the forgiving power of the Son of God. Let me tell you about that son. The Bible says that my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. And that's my king. Do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. He is immortally graceful. He is empirically powerful, impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomena that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of salvation. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. I wonder if you know Him. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meager. I wonder. I wonder. Do you know him? If you know him, let's go share him with all those who don't know him. Come to Jesus as we stand and sing.